Hello, my name is Jack. After doing it with Kingdom Hearts, everyone seems to want it to become a thing, so I'm going to make it a thing. I'm going to try and make more videos that summarise the plots and series of different games, especially the longer and more complex ones, but I'm going to start off with something nice and simple, something I'm kind of familiar with, so if you're a fan of this, you might enjoy this. If you're not, then here's an introduction to it, but of course, spoilers, I probably should have mentioned that in my Kingdom Hearts one, but I didn't, and the title does speak for itself, but just so you know, I am going to go through the entire plot of series when I do this. So here is a complete recap of the Jack and Daxter series. Now, I didn't think I would need to mention this in the Kingdom Hearts one, but apparently I did for a couple people, so I'm going to say it now. Jack and Daxter is a video game series. You can find it on the PlayStation 2 or the PlayStation 3 where a high definition collection was made for it. Our story begins in Sandover Village, where we find a young boy called Jack living there under the wing of an old man named Samos. Living with Jack are his best friend Daxter and Samos' daughter Kira. One night, Jack and Daxter disobey Samos' instructions and head off to the treacherous Misty Island. While they're there, they come across an army of lurkers. Lurkers are a bunch of violent, lumbering creatures that seem to make up the entire wildlife of Jack and Daxter's world. Swell. Seeing two mysterious figures leading this army for what seems to be evil purposes, they back away and find a large pool of dark eco. Eco is a substance in this world that comes in various forms, colours and powers. They can do all sorts of things and are generally used as a sort of energy or fuel source in the world. Those who can channel and use the power of eco and understand it are called sages. Samos himself is a green sage for green eco, whereas Jack seems to be able to channel just about any use of eco. He's a bit of a young sage in the making as it were. Daxter? Not so much. You see, out of all the eco, dark eco is one of the most powerful and most dangerous and most unpredictable substances. Daxter ends up falling in it when they get attacked by a lurker, and he pops out as a little furry orange thing called an otzel, a cross between an otter and a weasel. The two boys return back to their home and tell Samos what happened, and, well, Daxter does, since Jack doesn't really talk. And together they decide to set off north to where Gaul lives. Gaul is a dark eco sage, and with his help they might be able to turn Daxter back to normal, which is what they currently want. And Kira offers to help them with her mechanical prowess, building a zoomer, which is capable of flying across molten lava with a heat shield, which requires power cells, and so they have to collect them. They travel up to Rock Village, which is under attack by lurkers, and the blue sage which governs the village was building a way to sort out the problem, but he disappeared. So they have to fix the machine using power cells, which they again have to collect, and fight off the giant lurker that's terrorising the village, and proceed. Proceed that is to the volcanic crater where the red sage lives. But the red sage is missing too. It turns out that Gaul was the mysterious figure at the beginning of the game. He and his sister Maya have been twisted by Dark Eco, and are using a precursor robot to try and drill their way into the silos, a deep, massive storage of Dark Eco which they plan to flood the world with, which would leave it in total ruin and chaos and darkness. Oh yes, the Precursors. The Precursors are said to be the most powerful beings in the universe, supposed to be responsible for a lot of technology and all the eco in the world. They're effectively what gave the planet life and are supposed to have disappeared long ago, and Samos is kind of obsessed with discovering the mystery behind the Precursors. In order to power their Precursor robot, Gaul and Maya have been kidnapping the sages and draining their power, and sure enough, by the time Jack and Daxter make it to their citadel through the use of collecting more power cells, they also find that Samos has been kidnapped as well. Can't leave him alone for five minutes. Despite how weird they all are, Jack and Daxter are able to rescue the sages and stop them from charging the robot any further, but it's too late. Gaul and Maya already have enough power and begin to open up the silos. Jack and Daxter face off against them using the powers of the various eco and are able to thwart their plans, destroy the robot, and send Gaul and Maya straight into the silos. So I guess they got what they wanted. In the process, Daxter gives up the possibility of turning back to normal through the use of white eco, which Jack uses instead to destroy the robot. It would be kind of tragic, but Daxter's pretty happy. So in the end, the day is saved, Gaul and Maya are stopped, and Jack and Kira almost kiss. Then they discover a giant gate on top of Gaul and Maya's citadel, through the use of collecting more power cells. They're able to open the gate and discover a massive rift gate, a gate within a gate, and a rift rider, which interacts with the rift gate. Now if you haven't guessed from the name, the rift gate seems to be a portal into other realms, space, time, not entirely sure, but the rift rider interacts with it, and after a bit of time, Kira is able to figure it all out, and together the bunch of them decide to set off through the gate after accidentally opening it to a swarm of giant beasts called the Metalheads, which are basically monsters. Monsters who apparently have a long-standing rivalry slash uh, animosity with the Precursors. So after accidentally releasing the greatest threat to life as we know it, and the possible creators of the planet's worst enemies into the world, Jack and the gang just shoot into the rift gate, end up getting separated and crash into this strange world. This strange new place is Haven City. It's a massive city surrounded by wastelands and large walls which keep out the Metalhead invasion. The Metalheads run rampant in this world. Good luck to anyone who travels outside the walls where you could possibly get slaughtered by the Metalheads. The city relies on the oppressive rule of Baron Praxis to keep them at bay, and Baron Praxis is not a very nice man. In this world, the weak die and the strong survive. Oi, stop it. Jack is almost immediately apprehended by the friendly Crimson Guard, Baron Praxis's very sweet police force. Their motto is, surrender and die. 
Over the next two years, Daxter runs around the city telling bar stories and trying to find a way to save Jack. Mostly telling bar stories though. Eventually though, he manages to hook up with an extermination company, and using his connections with them, he's able to find a way into the prison and save Jack, who has been tortured for two years by being injected with Dark Eco. Long story short, Baron Praxis was desperate for an advantage against the Metalheads in their war, so he tried to create the Dark Warrior program. By infusing soldiers with Dark Eco, he hoped to turn one of them into a dark powered super soldier. And so far, Jack is the only project that actually survived the experiments, and even then he showed no signs of change. It's a bit like Captain America, only longer, more painful, less successful, and a higher death rate. Luckily for Jack, Baxter arrives to save him, uh, though the most he does is rouse him, and that causes Jack to find his voice at last. Say something! Just this once! I'm gonna kill Praxis! Not only that, but the Dark Warrior program was a success! Yay! So Jack turns into Dark Jack for the first time, breaking out of prison alongside Daxter, and they immediately run into Kor, an old man with a mysterious kid who's apparently very important due to that necklace around his neck. By the way, this meeting was not a coincidence, as you'll find out later. Jack wrestles with his darker alter ego and is very much keen to get some revenge on Praxis, so he joins the Underground Movement, a faction which is against the Crimson Guard and Baron Praxis and everything he stands for and plans to overthrow him and take over the city to save it and put the rightful heir on the throne since Baron Praxis is a usurper in the first place, and of course, save it from the Metalheads. Spearheading a lot of their missions is a man called Torn with a very gruff voice, who's ex-Crimson Guard and hates Baron Praxis with all his soul. Isn't he the most popular Baron ever? The leader of the Underground is a mysterious figure known as the Shadow, who Jack and Daxter don't get to meet for a while, but in the meantime they get put in touch with a few other contacts, such as Tess, a lively young lady who works for the Underground and Daxter is very fond of, and surprisingly she's very fond of Daxter. There's also Onan, a very old and very wise soothsayer. Her interpreter is Pecker, who speaks for her, and Pecker, yes, is a Moncaw, a cross between a monkey and a Maycaw, and he and Daxter have a very vicious rivalry. There's also Vin, a paranoid geek who's apparently the only person managing the city's power keeping the shield wall up, as the shield wall is the only thing that keeps the metalheads out, really. And Ashlyn, an old friend of Torn's who still works in the Crimson Guard and apparently has a sort of thing with him. Jack and Daxter also start picking up jobs from a man called Crew, a bit of an underlord who knows a lot of what's going on in the city and provides Jack with a bit of information in exchange for the odd job. Allies of Crew that Jack and Daxter are also put in touch with is Sig, a mercenary from the Wasteland who hunts metalheads for fun, or a living, and a mysterious mechanic who Jack and Daxter do a few races for and decide to enter the Grand Prix in order to get a visit to the palace because they really want to meet Praxis again. So as their journey progresses, Jack and Daxter use the Dark Jack powers, new guns and a jetboard sort of skateboard type thing in order to fight against the Crimson Guard and the Metalheads while doing missions for everyone and thickening the plot. As it turns out, the mysterious kid, the amulet around his neck, possibly means he's the heir of Mar, which means he's the rightful ruler of Haven City. You see, Mar is this legendary hero who apparently held off the Metalheads, built Haven City and the Eco Power Grid and the Mines. Yeah, one man pulled off the impossible. The legends might be a bit exaggerated. However, he was supposed to be a very close friend to the Precursors, so... Anyway, his lineage continued the rule of Haven City until one of his successors was overthrown by Baron Praxis, who was the lieutenant of that successor. However, the kid is possibly the rightful heir to the throne and that's probably why Baron Praxis wants him so badly. Jack was picked up possibly by mistake of being the kid and well it got, it got worse from there. Seeing a really big plot twist, it turns out the world they're in is not some sort of alternate world or a strange place, they are actually in the future. Jack and Daxter recognise that this is their world in the future after it fell to the Metalheads. And there's even more plot twists because it turns out the mysterious mechanic is Kira and the Shadow, the leader of the underground, is Samos the Sage, only he seems a lot younger and has no idea who Jack and Daxter is. Jack and Daxter also unearth a very suspicious conspiracy between Baron Praxis and the Metalhead leader. The two of them have a deal going, where Baron Praxis supplies them with Eco, and the Metalheads will continue to attack the city only a little bit, enough to satisfy the city that they think that Baron Praxis is indeed protecting him and keeping Baron Praxis elected. So yeah, that's why he's so popular. But unfortunately it's not really going to last because the city is running out of Eco, and the Metalheads, they're getting tired of pretending. Brief side note for those of you who are wondering whatever happened to the Lurkers. Well without Gol and Maya's influence, the Lurkers aren't actually that bad. But Baron Praxis is using them as slave labour. You actually help a very sophisticated and civilised lurker called Bruter to free some of his pals, and Bruter promises to repay Jack and Daxter whenever the time is right. As things progress, the legends of a Precursor Stone start reaching the pointy slash fuzzy ears of Jack and Daxter. You see, the Precursor Stone is said to be the last Precursor Egg that Mar hid away from the Metalheads and the city. 
no one really knows where it is, but Baron Praxis is searching for it, because with this fragile deal he's got running with the Metalheads, he really needs an ace in the hole to get rid of him for good, and the Precursor Stone just might have the power to do that. Unfortunately, he plans to use it to detonate it in the Metalhead Nest, which would release enough power to destroy everything. So everybody's racing to find the Precursor Stone first. Jack and Daxter manage to get the Seal of Mar and use it to unearth Mar's tomb, where the Precursor Stone is said to be, and then they enter the tomb alone, passing the cess of manhood in order to get at the Precursor Stone. But Baron Praxis followed them, kidnapping a lot of Jack and Daxter's pals, and he tries to get the Precursor Stone, and in a battle with Jack and Daxter, he succeeds, Jack and Daxter aren't able to stop him. It turns out that Torn turned them in in order to save Ashlyn's life, so Jack and Daxter have to break into the fortress to save all their friends. Once they do, they discover that there are two Samos the Sages, the older one that they know, and the younger one who's working as the Shadow that they've been meeting all this time. Kira reveals that she's been working on a machine just like the Rift Rider that took them there in order to get them back to their own world once they find a Rift Gate in order to get there, but she's missing a few pieces so Jack and Daxter have to go collect them. In the meantime, Jack and Daxter step up to the final race, the Grand Prix finale that will get them into the palace. A particularly dangerous rival in this race is Errol. He hates Jack with a passion. He worked for Baron Praxis as practically his second in command, kind of Torn's replacement. He was part of the Dark Eco program, injecting Jack with the Dark Eco, and he's determined to finish him off in this race. Of course, Jack and Daxter win. Baron Praxis isn't very happy about that, to say nothing about what Errol felt about it. He tries to ram Jack, but instead crashes into the month's supply of Eco that he was awarded for winning, and Errol is, uh, well, you know. So Jack and Daxter get into the palace, plot twist, Ashlyn is Baron Praxis' daughter. Ashlyn confronts them and Jack and Daxter have to convince her that her father is actually a bit of a psychopath. Fortunately, Ashlyn is a smart girl and is very aware of what Baron Praxis is like, and when she finds out that the Precursor Stone will destroy everything, she decides to help them. Through her help, Jack and Daxter make their way through a weapons facility full of like Crimson Guard robots and stuff, and on top they find Crew, who's built a massive piercer bomb that's going to destroy the Precursor Stone and the world, but mainly the Nest, which is his target. After Jack and Daxter turn on him, they engage in a battle, which Crew loses, and he tries to detonate the bomb, blowing them all up with him. Fortunately, Ashlyn shows up in time to save them, and Crew's plan blows up in his face. Then they get back to Crew's place, where they find the other piece that's left to find for the Rift Rider is inside a machine. Daxter takes on the challenge and manages to get it, and once they do, they discover that the Metalheads have invaded the city. Thanks to the betrayal of both Core and Crew, the Metalheads were able to get in past the shield wall or through secret passages. In the midst of all this turmoil, they manage to attack Vin. Jack and Daxter go looking for Sig, who was sent underwater by Crew into some ruins. When Jack and Daxter find them, they find out that Sig was sent to unlock one of these passages and cause the Metalheads to stream in. The three of them fight their way out until Sig is ambushed by a Metalhead and disappears into a dark cavern. Between Sig and Vin, Jack and Daxter's friends are dropping like lurker flies, but before Vin dies he sends Jack and Daxter one last message to go to the construction site. When they get there they find that Baron Praxis is there alongside a few guards, and then Core Ninja jumps in, and turns out he's not an old man at all, he's the Metalhead leader, masquerading as an old man all this time. He and Baron Praxis have a, a confrontation where Baron Praxis is blown up because he tried to Leroy Jenkins the guy and it didn't work, obviously. So Jack and Daxter are left with Baron Praxis who reveals the location of the pre Cursor Stone which is hidden in a second bomb because, you know, always have a backup. With that, Baron Praxis passes away leaving the Precursor Stone in Jack and Daxter's hands. You know, with all these plot twists I could make a reference to M. Night Shyamalan, but I won't. Everybody gathers in the stadium and the Rift Rider is finally finished and they're ready to go back to their own time but they need another Rift Gate or Rift Ring which they came in in the first place and apparently the only one in this world is somewhere in the Metalhead Nest. In order to get there, Bruter shows up and offers the gang the help of his Lurker Balloons which will help carry the Rift Rider there. In the meantime, Jack and Dexter have to go to the nest beforehand and uh, do a bit of spring cleaning. Using Mars' final weapon, Jack and Daxter power it with the Precursor Stone in order to blast a hole in the Metalhead Nest. And gung-ho, well at least one of them is, they charge into the Metalhead Nest, or at least one of them does, and they face off against Metal Core. You know, I think despite all the plot twists, the story's been pretty easy going, wouldn't you agree? Oh, by the way, the kid, uh, the kid that Core has right now, that's Jack. That's Jack from the future. The younger Jack. What? Metalcore explains that the kid is indeed Jack from the future who was sent into the past through that rift gate that uh, Jack and Daxter are looking at right now, which will take him into the past where Jack grows up into Jack. The kid is sent back in time to become Jack who then comes forward in time to meet his younger self here and now but unfortunately Jack's gonna die if he doesn't stop Core and Core will feast on the Precursor Stone which is the last Precursor Egg, an actual Precursor, which was defended by Mar from the Precursor's mortal enemy, the Metalheads. So Jack's the heir of Mar, isn't that cool? M. Night Shyamalan would be proud. So let's skip to the good bit. Core dies, the kid wakes up the Precursor Stone and an actual Precursor is revealed to everyone who heads through the Rift Gate and promises Jack that the darkness inside him that's been tormenting him through the entire game has been balanced out by light so Jack won't be destroyed by his own darkness, which was a kind of a subplot that I ignored. 
So young Jack and young Samos head back in time to the place where they will grow into the people that we know and love today, and then Jack and Daxter and everyone head back to Haven City, which is clear of Metalheads after Metalcore's death, without a leader they kind of fell apart. Ashlyn is elected governess, and Torn's like her partner and all that. They have a nice party, but they mourn their losses, but it turns out Sig's alive! Sig shows up to celebrate with them all, and Jack and Daxter are all happy and everything goes well, and Jack and Kira almost kiss. When you think about it though, there's some paradoxes in there. Like Jack's name, how do, how do we know his name's Jack? He just sort of, it's just a name he has, and they think that the kid's name is Jack because the older version that they've met is called Jack, so that's why he's called Jack, but no one actually named him Jack. And then there's of course uh, Kira's Rift Rider, she built that off memory, even though it's the same Rift Rider, the exact same Rift Rider that she saw, which she's basing the Rift Rider design she built off of. And Well anyway, you get the point, let's not waste our time on this. Now you'd think after all that chaos, everything would be plain sailing, but no, over the course of the next year, the palace is destroyed when there's a massive war breaking out across the entire city between the combined underground and Crimson Guard, which has become the Freedom League, the metalheads who have survived, some of them have survived and taken over the west side of the city, and the, the Crimson Guard robots which take over the industrial section. The Crimson Guard robots have just swarmed the city through a floating war factory which hovers over the entire city for the entirety of this war. A mysterious new leader has arisen uniting all of these factions against Haven City, but in the meantime Jack and Daxter's worst enemy is politics as the Grand Council of Haven City needs someone to blame. So they pin the whole thing on Jack, partly for his dark eco powers and his friendship with crew and everything that went on in Jack 2. Jack is blamed as a scapegoat for the entire thing and cast out into the wasteland, into the desert, miles away from the city, wandering alone, well with Daxter and Pecker who tag along because Jack's their friend and they're not going to let him do it alone, which is really nice of them, but then they all seem to die. However, Ashlyn provided Jack with a beacon which alerts Damus, the leader of Spargus City, an entire community made out of people cast out from Haven City. They find Jack and Daxter and Pecker and bring them in. So Jack and Daxter settle into Spargus City where they get to know Damus a bit and get nice and close with him, whereas Pecker decides to be Damus's new advisor and his relationship with Daxter does not improve. Jack and Daxter also run into this really ferocious racer called Cleaver that neither of which really get along with, as well as a monk called Seam who I think is a woman. I think. So Damus gets proud of Jack, Cleaver wants to eat Daxter, and Seam doesn't like Jack's dark eco powers, not the first person to do so. However, over the course of the game and visiting temples, Jack starts to discover light eco powers and becomes light Jack as well as dark Jack, fully bringing out the balance. Ashlyn pops out to ask Jack to come back to Haven City and save everyone, but Jack is still ticked off about just getting kicked out like that and no one really standing by him other than Daxter and Pecker, so he chooses to stay with his new custom life in Spargus, but later he relents and decides to head back to Haven City anyway, where he encounters Count Viger, one of the guys who was very prominent in throwing Jack out. Count Viger is the head of the council in Haven City and is a very strong believer in light eco. He hates all darkness and all dark eco and refuses to see Jack as a hero because of it. Needless to say, he doesn't really get along with Jack and has a bit of a god complex because he wants to use the power of the precursors to save everyone and be a big hero and no one likes him. Seriously, nobody likes him. You don't like him. I don't like him. But you know who we do all like? Sig! You know, for fun in Spargus, they like to pit people to the death against each other in arenas, and when this happens to Jack and Daxter and they come face to face with Sig, each side refuses to kill each other. Damus gets them into trouble for it, but they get let off, partly because Sig was a spy in Haven City, and he served Damus well for that. Later, it turns out Sig was spying in Haven City looking for Damus' son, who was lost to him a long time ago. Jack and Daxter make it back to Haven City, where they end up in the port at the south side of the city, which is sealed off from the north side of the city by the Crimson Guard robots, and since they're penned in, Torn's down there, he's in command of Daxter's old pub trying to keep everything together but it looks like they're losing control and all hope is lost but Jack comes in to save the day. In the meantime it turns out this this leader that's been gathering together all of the metalheads and the KG deathbots to attack the city and start this whole war is Errol. Errol survived his encounter uh, with Jack and Daxter and Jack 2 in his explosion and has survived as a cyborg. A cyborg that's taken control of the robots and made contact with the metalheads and got them all working together to try and destroy everything. It's safe to say Errol's got a few screws loose. You could also say he's just plain nuts. With Jack and Daxter's intervention, bit by bit they managed to win back Haven City from the metalheads and the KG deathbots, winning victory after victory, pushing back Errol's forces. But as this is all happening, they're constantly aware of a threat known as the Daystar, this bright star in the sky that Seam constantly prophesies about. Viger is also aware of this threat, and as it becomes closer and closer, it's discovered that this is the Dark Makers. When the Precursors got a little too close to Dark Eagle, they went insane and got twisted, and turned into the Dark Makers, who have their own form of basically evil, twisted Precursor technology, 
which is manifested in this satellite, which is floating up in the shape of this star. It gets closer and closer to their planet every day, and as the Dark Maker threat looms, they threaten to destroy all life and basically the entire world, and Jack and Daxter are obviously going to have to stop it. No rest for the wicked. Yeah, and speaking of Count Vega... It's Vega! Yeah, whatever. He basically tries to blackmail everyone by saying, I've got the way to save the world, you can trust me, get rid of Jack. But everyone, of course, favours Jack, and Ashlyn basically fires the guy. It's pretty awesome. Now, there is a precursor weapon hidden deep in the Earth that's capable of counteracting this Daystar threat. It lies deep at the centre of the Earth, which can be reached through the catacombs, which are underneath uh, Haven City. And in order to reach them, Vigor was actually the one who destroyed the palace. He did so in order to get at the catacombs and at this weapon in the first place. So, uh, yeah, what a jerk. As for Jack and Daxter, they've been collecting eco crystals throughout their journey, and they use these to form an ecosphere capable of powering the weapon and using it to stop the threat. So, they head off into the catacombs, but in order to do so, they have to fight past waves of enemies, and they end up getting cornered by some Dark Makers. But Damus busts in to save the day, and they drive off together into the sunset before they get blown up. And Damus dies. But just before Damus dies, the tragic truth is revealed. You see, Damus was descended from Mars' family, as in he was the leader of Haven City before Baron Praxis betrayed him and cast him out, starting up Spargus City in the first place. As in the heir to Mar was Damus' long lost son. As in the kid, as in Jack. Jack is Damus' son. The kid they found in Jack 2 and sent back into the past was Damus' kid. He grew up into Jack, and Jack is now cradling his dying father. Just before Jack can tell Damus that, Damus dies. But if you think that's the worst of it, then get this. Vegan. It's Vega! Nobody cares! Because Vegan was the one who took the kid from Damus in the first place. That's how the kid ended up in Haven City for Jack 2. He was kidnapped by Vegan, and then he got lost to the underground. And there he is, standing over Jack, cradling his dead father's body, and he's gloating over the fact that Damus' dying wish was to find his son, never knowing that Jack was his son. So naturally, Jack and Daxter are very angry and they go to chase Vigor into the catacombs in a bloodthirsty rage. So after all that drama, they reach the centre of the world, power up the weapon, and a Precursor appears to Jack and thanks him for being such a great hero, and he offers him the chance to become a Precursor. But they're interrupted by Vigor. It's Vigor! But that's what I said! Oh, forget it. Anyway, Vigor takes the power of Precursor dumb for himself and points a gun at Jack, but the Precursors complain about the fact that Jack and Vigor and everybody were all too late. The Daystar's probably already going to destroy the world and everything's falling apart. Then the Precursor starts to argue with himself and then the thing opens up and... Wait a minute. Yes, it turns out the legendary Precursors were just a bunch of Otzels who fluffed up the myth and made everyone think that they were really cool just so that people would, you know, actually worship them and take them seriously. But their tech's still pretty cool and it, it's possibly that's why they're so powerful in the first place. Daxter's very happy, of course, but he complains that he doesn't have any clothes the way they do. And Vigor, well, he's less than overjoyed. In order to stop Errol from making any moves too quickly, the Precursors teleport Jack and Daxter up to the Dark Makers to stop them from attacking the planet before the Precursors can just shoot them. So they do that, and they fight, fight Errol and nothing happens, and the thing gets shot, and just before it blows up, Jack and Daxter may manage to make it out, but not before Errol can get away. The Dark Makers and the ship have been completely destroyed, and yet Errol is still there with a pi piloting a giant mech left behind from them, and still plans to destroy whatever he can, because, let's face it, Errol's insane at this point. Jack and Daxter vow to stop him, for now I mean Damus. So they face Errol in an epic showdown and Errol dies, they win the end. Happy days. Later the Precursors are congratulating everyone on everything that's happened. Samus is a bit baffled about the Precursors' true identity. Daxter has the chance to become a human again. They offer him a reward for all of his... Oh, he just wants pants. Okay. As for Tess, Tess is all pleased about Daxter's new pants, so the Precursors turn her into an Otzel as well. Seems fair. As for Vigor, he ends up with Cleaver as uh, his own little sidekick. It's more than you deserve, you little... So the day is saved, everybody's happy, and Daxter and Tess almost kiss. As for Jack, the Precursors are offering to take him up into the universe so Jack can be a hero to other worlds as well, which is pretty cool. Daxter chooses to stay behind, and so Jack decides to stay behind as well. The two of them are inseparable, un and that's pretty darn cool. So uh, they all cheerily smile and have a nice time, and yeah, that's the end of their adventure. It sure would be a shame if one year later they were called to a place called Kraz City to, read, to hear the reading of the will of a certain criminal underworld boss guy who Jack and Dexter may or may not have worked for and may or may not have killed afterwards. But that's what happened. Turns out Crew had a daughter, her name is Rain, and there is no family resemblance whatsoever. At the reading of the will, everyone has a little toast, and it turns out the toast was poisoned. Crew set the whole thing up so that everybody present would have to work for him as a combat racing team in order to win this big prize, and it turns out to be involved in some great big bet. You see, Crew's a big criminal family, you know, and 
He was in a rivalry with another criminal family, led by a guy called Mizo, who's a mysterious criminal underworld guy, and uh, they had a massive bet going on involving the sport of combat racing, just driving and shooting basically. It's pretty good, so they got Jack and Daxter and everybody to help them out for the sake of this uh, bet, and as the sport goes on, that's what they do, because they're poisoned, and in order to get the antidote, they have to finish the race and win. Rain claims not to have been in on it, because she drank the poison as well, so she's clear, I guess, and Sig shows up to help them out, even though he hasn't been poisoned, because Sig's an awesome guy, don't ever forget it. The commentator for the entire sport is GT Blitz, he runs the whole thing in a sense, and uh, he has to share the limelight with Pecker, who joins him as a commentator because Pecker wants to have a bit of spotlight in order to shed some of his investigations into the criminal workings of this sport, and GT Blitz does not like sharing the spotlight with him. Jack and Dexter have to deal with measles thugs such as Razor and UR86 and Cleaver? Yeah, Cleaver shows up and wants to best Jack and Daxter in this sport, but that doesn't work out for him. Jack and Daxter win race after race, beat all the guys and everyone gets wiped out and until they do the final race of the entire thing and GT Blitz takes part in it. Turns out GT Blitz is Mizo. Who knew? Yeah, there was also a bit of a bonus thing because it turns out that GT Blitz's father was killed by Mizo's gang, so that implies that Mizo killed his own father, but uh, that doesn't really matter because GT Blitz gets killed in the end anyway. He tried to steal the antidote, but Jack chased him down, shot him down, and took the antidote back. So once again, the day is saved. Everyone's cured of the poison and everyone feels better about it. Rain turns out to have been in on it the whole time and was never actually poisoned to begin with, but she gets away and nobody really cares. And Jack and Kira almost ki No, wait, they do. They actually do kiss. Alright, cool. They actually do kiss. And that, my friends, is the end of the Jack and Daxter series so far. There hasn't been any other games since then. Nobody's made any other sort of a game to follow on from it. There hasn't been a, a, a real sequel to it. There hasn't been any games that continue the story yet. We're kind of waiting for that, but it hasn't happened at all. No other game has come out since then under the name of Jack and Daxter. No real Jack and... Daxter game... In an alternate universe where Jack has a different voice, Kira wears jackets and Daxter isn't funny, Jack, Kira and Daxter are all heading off to the brink, the edge of the world, to find a new eco-source because there's a new eco-source shortage, which you'd really think would happen every other Tuesday. And they go to the brink of the world to find floating pirate ships and floating spaceships. Do I have to do this? It turns out the really big ship belongs to this race of people called the Europans and they're led by Duke Skyheed of Europa and uh, yeah, they help Jack and Daxter out because Jack and Daxter helped them out against some pirates. So they have a thing called the Eco Seeker and they want to use the Eco Seeker in order to um, find a big source of eco power uh, in the brink, which is of course what Jack and Daxter and Kira are looking for, so they all agree to work together, which is nice. But then the Eco Seeker and Kira are just taken by the pirates. Uh, Captain Phoenix is the leader of the pirates and he ta takes it all. Jack and Daxter end up crashing on an island where they meet a castaway. His name is Tim, get over it. Tim helps them fix the helicarrier. He's this uh, really old hermit guy who has no memory of anything conveniently. They manage to catch up with Phoenix and everyone and there's this really cliched love triangle between Jack, Phoenix and Kira. Don't bother looking into it because nothing comes of it. They end up losing the Eco Seeker and have to get it back for no reason and then they need more light eco so they go to a place to get it and it turns out the Europans, the, the race of people with grey skin that Jack and Daxter were hanging out with earlier, they've been experimenting with dark eco and uh, when Jack finds that out he's not pleased because you know he knows what that's like and he doesn't like it. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention that there's a really shaky weird truce that Jack and Phoenix are working out right now to get this all done and in the mid midst of this they all become great friends predictably and uh, it turns out that Phoenix was the leader of a fleet for the Europans but he found out what Duke Skyheed was up to because Duke Skyheed turns out to be the villain to the surprise of nobody because he was experimenting with Dark Eco and Tim was a Dark Eco uh, sage but unlike Gaul he didn't go mad for some reason and uh, they all kind of fell out and since then they haven't been talking and they all decide together we're gonna stop Duke Skyheed from doing his bad stuff because Dark Eco is bad. But then Phoenix is betrayed by his right hand man. Tragic. Oh and uh, Skyheed's uh, right hand man, he led Jack and Daxter to help them but gets killed really quickly. What a shame. And uh, Dark Daxter appears a couple more times but he still does nothing. Uh... Alright, forget it. Phoenix dies and Scoot Duke Sky he dies, all the Europans die, and Jack Jackster and Kira and Tim all live happily ever after next to the eco core. There. That's what happens. The more you think about it, the more it hurts the head. <sighs> okay. I've bleached my brain now, so I feel better. And uh, that's me done. That's the entire Jack and Daxter series overall covered and completed until they make another game, which may or may not happen. Seems that Naughty Dog still have something in mind for them, but we'll never know. For sure, for now anyway. <coughs> so a few people are probably going to notice this video is a lot longer than my What is Kingdom Hearts one. 
despite the fact that Kingdom Hearts is a much longer and far more complicated series with more games in it. I guess that's partly because I did kind of um, rush a lot of stuff in Kingdom Hearts, and I didn't want to do that for this video because people didn't really appreciate that in the first one, it, was, it left a lot of questions hanging, so I decided to go into further detail with the lore of the series and everything. If I did that for the Kingdom Hearts series it'd be a lot longer, I can assure you. So um, I also slowed down, people complained that I was talking too fast, and uh, I did keep the fast talking for quite a few moments in this video, I'm sure you noticed, and uh, I, I just, you know, it wouldn't be the same if I didn't, but uh, at the same time I don't want the video to be too long, and uh, as I say that we're almost at the half hour mark, so I'm going to wrap up the video here, uh, feedback, what did you guys think, was this good, do you want me to do more of this, and if I do, uh, like, are there any ways I could improve it, and what series would you like me to cover, I've got a couple in mind, but um, of course, you know, the more complicated the better, I suppose, but of course it will take time to get through them all, and uh, if there's a series you suggest that I haven't played, you're going to have to help me out on that one, and I'll do my best to summarise it um, as best I can, so that's, uh, that's all I have to really say for now, so thank you for watching, and uh, have a nice day.